uh, it, it actually, it truly is an honor to be here. Uh, I was telling Marjorie when I came in here when I was in high school looking at colleges. I grew up in Massachusetts and went to a small uh, high school. I was one of uh, 94 kids who graduated. So when I looked at schools in and around North Carolina, Catawba was one of them. It actually came down to Catawba and Lenore Ryan. And what actually tipped it in Lenore Ryan's favor is when I visited college, I would visit a racetrack. And when I visited Lenore Ryan, they're in Hickory, they had Hickory Motor Speedway. Bob Freeman was the general manager of that track, and Bob said, Mike, you come to Lenore Ryan, I'll hook you up with a race team. So, <laughs> so great school. Um, and uh, happy to be here. So I don't want to, I guess I don't want to bore you guys. I've been in your seats before. So I want to try to make this as, as interactive as possible. I'll give you a little bit of background, but help me out. Kind of, who am I talking to here? Seniors, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen. Nice, nice little mix here. All right, I'll try to uh, make this as, as quick as possible to, to give you some background, but I grew up in Massachusetts, and I am a wannabe race car driver now living vicariously through my clients. Um, I, uh, mom and dad were always supportive of, of what I want to do, but, and, but they weren't racers. There was no racing family there. I don't know how I got into it, I just did it. The 8500, the Daytona 500 was on TV. I was glued to it. But it wasn't until uh, my dad and I went to Thompson Speedway in Thompson, Connecticut uh, when I was probably a, a freshman or, or sophomore in high school where I finally figured out, oh, that's how you go racing. The New England Quarter Midget Association has set up a display and kids as young as five could race a quarter midget around a, around a racetrack. And I'm like, that's how you go racing. But I'm, by the time I went to go racing, I was a sophomore in high school, and I'm trying to compete against kids who have been doing this since they were five. Uh, it was very, very hard. And at the same time, I didn't know I mean, and, and Dad supported me, and, and uh, but I can remember there, there was a limit to his mechanical knowledge, so he'd be on the back of the tailgate of our 87 Dodge Dakota reading the Boston Globe, and I'm getting my car ready because I know more about it than he does. It's not like he was disinterested, he just actually knows more. But the scary thing was when I first got the car, I, you know, you, I would pump up the tires with a bicycle pump, stick my thumb, like, yeah, it's hard enough, we'll go. Like, that's how <laughs> out of touch I was. But as the season went on, you learned more, there were other people who helped you, to where Dad was still reading the Boston Globe on the back of the tailgate, but depending on the weather conditions, I'm putting on a harder compound tire or a softer compound tire, I got the right front at, you know, 32 degrees, the, you know, the right rear at 38, you know, I'm, I'm figuring it out. So long story short, I wanted to be a race car driver, and in everything that I had seen and heard, in order to become a race car driver, go to Charlotte, North Carolina. So that's what I did. Now, if I had had my, if I didn't have any direction from my parents, I would have stayed in New England. I probably would have been at some machine shop, an auto body shop, fixing transmissions or whatever, and trying to race locally, work my way up to the modified tour, maybe push north, and then make a splash down here. Uh, that would mean not going to college, and it was not an option in the Army household. So we uh, split the difference and said, all right, I'll go to college, but it's got to be within a 60 mile radius of Charlotte Motor Speedway. So literally, my sophomore year of high school, Dad and I drew a 60 mile radius circle around Charlotte. So we looked at Catawba, Lenore Rhine, UNCC, uh, Wingett, Appalachian State, uh, Western Carolina. Some kind of went out of that 60 mile radius, but when we looked at schools, we looked at a racetrack, and I knew what I wanted to do, and I figured I could go to school and I could go race. Yeah. Um, reality hit pretty hard, as probably well know, that getting an education is, is not cheap, and, and I think going racing is even uh, less cheap. Um, and it just didn't job. I was spinning my wheels trying to make a go of it. And so finally, after uh, testing cars and practicing cars, I just didn't have the money to go out. Just I didn't have money to do it. So I needed to use OPM, other people's money. And uh, so what we tried to do there was I tried to make myself as marketable as possible. I remember going to Hickory Chair, Comscope, uh, Sure Tape, the duct tape manufacturer, they're all on Hickory. 
And I would say, you know, I can do this. I can be a brand ambassador. I can run Hickory Motor Speedway, Tri-County Motor Speedway, other big late model races here. And I'm like, well, this is great, but you don't have a team. You don't have a car. You don't have a truck to even get your car if you have a car to race track. You know, you get all that. Come back and talk to us. This is, you know, this is a good proposal. So I'm like, all right, well, what the hell? That's good. So I go down and talk to other car owners, and they say, well, thank this is all really good. We don't have a dollar to your name. But until you get some sponsorship, we can't put you in the car. So there's this catch-22 that was uh, mildly infuriating. But what it did do, it made me focus on my time in college. And I knew I needed to create some skill sets to, I hadn't given up on racing, but if I wanted to work in the racing industry, I needed something more than uh, me lifting heavy armoires and sleeper sofas during the summer and delivering them to rich people or waiting tables at somewhere in downtown Hickory. So I, uh, I took advantage of what the school had to offer. And I think Catawba is a lot like Lenore Ryan. You know, the, the place, if you don't take advantage of what there is, is probably a pretty boring place. But if you dive in and take advantage of everything that's there, it's actually pretty awesome. So got involved with student government, became editor of the newspaper, um, got really involved with my fraternity. And one of the things that I did do during my just as you probably heard me talking about how we, me and my dad and I were planning during my sophomore year of high school for what I needed to do in college. My sophomore year in, in college, that's when I started trying to target uh, entities in motorsports where it made a lot of sense to get a good internship. And I wanted my internship to be the summer before my senior year so that I could then leverage those contacts to where I had a job when I graduated. So that's exactly what I did. So sophomore year, I, I targeted who I wanted uh, to be a part of who had strong internship programs. And you know, by the beginning of my junior year, it was it was like you're going for a job. Cover letters and resumes, why I'm good. And so I was able to get a great internship with Cotter Communication in the summer of 1996. Cotter Communication back in the day was a juggernaut when it came to public relations and marketing and all of motorsports. They had Western Auto, and Western Auto had a massive motorsports sponsorship with Darrell Walter and NASCAR, three NHRA teams, Top Fuel, two funny cars. They did uh, Mercedes-Benz in IndyCar and actually uh, ATP Tennis. They had John Deere and the Bush Series, now we know it's the Xfinity Series. Square D Company, Sears Die Hard in the Truck Series. Licensing was massive, show cars were meant, they had a lot of stuff going on. And I was lucky enough to, to land a spot in that. And that was a key cog to what got me here today because I spent that time that summer of uh, before my senior year and I worked my ass off and I made contacts and I volunteered for whatever would come down the pike. Tom Cotter came down the steps one day. There were two other interns with me and said, who wants to write a press release for the Sports Car Vintage Racing Association? I'll do it. And so I did it, and that first one was pretty rough. He had a yellow sheet process where you write it, and when you think it's ready for prime time, it goes to two, I guess, what if I was an employee, colleagues and a manager, and they read mine. And uh, that thing looked pretty ugly. It looked like somebody got murdered on that paper. So, uh, but it was great because I'm like, all right, that's, that's the expectation. And when I'm in, it's, June 1996, I got a whole year of schooling left. I already knew what the expectations were. And one of the best things that happened was I really got to know a lot of the folks at Square D. So by the time I graduated, Square D had moved to another agency. I kept in touch with all those people. And by the time that I graduated, actually, and one of the things that I did was a cross-country bicycle trip. I don't know how involved the Greek community here it is at Catawba, but at Lenormine, there were four fraternities. I joined Pi Kappa Phi, and one of our uh, philanthropy, our philanthropy was Push America. One of our major fundraising events was a cross-country bicycle trip that started in San Francisco and it ended in Washington, D.C. You had to raise $4,000 just to be a part of it, but then on top of that, you had to figure out a way to get yourself to San Francisco. So what I did, and I killed two birds with one stone, that was my communication thesis, like how I went ahead and trained, but also sold myself and sold the sponsorships. But I sold the sponsorships by reaching out not only to the Hickory community and the school, but I targeted motorsports, I targeted race teams. Felix Savannah like sent me like a $500 check. It was fantastic. But one of the other things, I raised the $4,000, but then I'm like, all right, how do we get to San Francisco? So I talked to a lot of people, and this new agency, Motorsports Decisions Group, they don't exist anymore, but Motorsports Decisions Group was the agency that was representing Square D. 
So those folks, uh, the president at the time, took her uh, frequent flyer miles and said, here's your ticket to San Francisco. So I put Lenore Ryan University on my helmet, I put Motorsports Decisions Group on my bike, and I lined up with an FM station out of Statesville, North Carolina, that was the MRN radio affiliate. And twice a week I would call it, whether I was in, you know, Reno, Nevada, or somewhere in Nebraska. By the time I got to Iowa, I had a job with Motorsports Decision Group, and it was this little bit of just serendipity, I guess. Motorsports Decision Group was trying to land some business with EA Sports. EA Sports was getting ready to launch NASCAR, I think it was 99 or 98. And these folks, this group from EA, flew in from California into Charlotte. They get their rental car, they're going to the offices, they're just no XM, serious satellite radio or anything. So they're spending the dial for a little bit. They just happen to tune in and to this FM country station at Statesville, North Carolina. Where, yeah, I'm Mike Arney. I'm so and so. I just want to thank everybody at Motorsports Decision Group and Lenore Ryan for giving me the opportunity to do this, hit my message points. And so they roll into this meeting like, we just heard that you sponsored some guy on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time I roll into Iowa, I had a job. Fantastic. So the uh, journey home ended in D.C. early August. My first race working was the Bristol Night Race, uh, late August. And it started hospitality, picking up dirty plates and empty beer cans. And you know, after a long day, we got up really early to put up banners and everything. But by the time uh, fall rolled around October, they needed a PR rep for the number 81 square eight Ford Thunderbird team of Philmar Racing and driver Kenny Wallace, and they tapped me. So my first race was actually a Winston West Series race at uh, that's still fairly new Las Vegas Motor Speedway. All the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series teams were running that race because in 98, that was going to be our inaugural race at Las Vegas. So we were using this Winston West race as a, as a test. So that was my first race as a rep. I'm all alone. I need a note from my boss to say, yes, he can rent a car. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I, I went I can remember seeing Matt Yoko working for TNN, the National Network. And I said, hi, I'm Mike Garning. This is what I'm doing. And let me know what you need. And then starting with the beginning of the 1998 season, I was a full-time rep in what was then the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. And it was with Kenny Wallace. And I guess I've always had crisis to deal with because Kenny Wallace missed the 1998 Daytona 500. We already had the scram. So I started with uh, Kenny in 98, and uh, he, he, he and Square D moved to a second car with Andy Petrie Racing in 1999. I represented that, but also in 1999, a young driver from the open wheel ranks, USAC champion, had done some Indy 500s, you may have heard of him, Tommy Stewart came on the scene. And uh, he started to do really, really well, and Home Depot realized that the PR infrastructure that they had in place was lacking business manager was also doing PR, it was just too much. He was doing, he was way too successful, way too soon for this one person to keep up with. So by the time the fall of 99 rolled around, they asked me, would you be interested in doing this? And I said, yes, but I made a commitment to my boss. You need to come to Motorsports Decisions Group. I'll still manage your program and I'll be the rep, but I'll go hire someone to do the square D stuff. That's what we did. So uh, beginning in, uh, 2000, I was the rep for Home Depot, and, and Tony Stewart hired someone to handle the Square D business, and we started growing that from there. Along the way, Joe Gibbs Racing began to grow, and their needs had eclipsed just being a two-car Winston Cup team. They purchased the assets of Diamond Ridge Motorsports, a Bush Series team, so now they had a two-car Bush Series team, a two-car Cup program, and then they were looking at becoming a three-car Cup program. And by default, I became Joe Gibbs Racing's Director of Communication. That's a role that I served until uh, Stewart House Racing came to be in 2009. But uh, along that way, Home Depot had a, uh, a change in management, and they wanted Edelman Public Relations to do all of their corporate communication. They had done, Home Depot was a massive uh, USOC sponsor. They did a lot of stuff with the Olympics. They wanted all under one roof. You know what? I'll try this. See what a big agency has to offer. So I spent two years at Edelman, moved down to Atlanta, and I got to see how a big agency works. That was good. And I got to see how a big agency works. And so there are some things that like we can do a better job than this at a better price point. So after Tony Stewart won the uh, his first championship in 2002, part of me was like, you know what? It's been a cool run. Got a championship ring. 
you know, you'll get a real job. And Tony's like, time out. As you may know, Tony isn't really a fan of dealing with the media, but he knows he has to do it. And so we had developed a rapport of the things that I brought to the table were quality and they were buttoned up. What do you think about coming to work for me? And I had always wanted to have my own agency, but quite honestly, the I know I can do the work. Taxes, payroll, HR, healthcare, all that stuff. That just was that seemed too big for me to comprehend. But he said, we can handle that because his infrastructure was already in place. He had a fan club, he had a race team, he had his own jet. So there were it was a small company, but I didn't plug into that and worry about growing through speed communication. And we founded that in April of 2003. And now we have uh, 10 people, including my wife, who uh, helped me out with that. And um, we have interests in NASCAR, Formula One, IndyCar, sports car, NHRA, and grassroots of the wood racing, where we're doing a lot of public relations, but also we, we are, I, I view us as, as a marketing agency where we're really actually executing the marketing initiatives that sometimes we come up with or sometimes that are handed down to us via, via the client or, uh, or what we need to do on behalf of the sanction fund. So that's my uh, way over two minute drill. Uh, <laughs> but that's kind of how I got from, from Lunenburg, Massachusetts to Hickory, North Carolina to uh, where I live now in Huntersville, North Carolina. So uh, I do a lot of writing, a ton. But I'll go ahead and open it up now for for any questions that you guys might might have, because uh, I don't want to bore you with a bunch of talk. Anyway. We have a lot of time for questions. We've got a good 15. So I can keep talking, but I guess all right. So but what what would be your best advice to them as college students as far as career? I guess I'll, I'll give you two things. It's really to, to plan out. And some of this, some of what I'm about to say will make some people uncomfortable. Uh, it'll make other people feel really good. It'll make other people say, I get my ass in gear. It'll make other people say, all right, I've still got time to figure this out. I cannot stress to you enough. You know, you, you're here for four years, maybe five years, uh, or six or seven. Uh, but you got to look at that those four years. That 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 first year, you, you can you can literally get the lay of the land. That that's that's cool. But really, by your sophomore year, you really need to start targeting what your passions are and how you can get a job that follows that passion to where you're not going to be like a, a struggling artist trying to like sell blood to pay your rent. You know, you everybody's going to get a job. It helps to get a job in an industry that you're passionate about. I work stupid hours. I work seven days a week. But I'm cool with that because it's in the industry that I love. Um, I actually feel like I'm making a difference. I am mean, building brands, not just a race team's brands, but a driver's brands and a sponsor's brands. And I'm helping sell more outdoor supplies at Bass Pro Shops or more motor oil for Mobile One. I actually feel like I'm making a difference and I think it's cool. So I shut down my laptop at midnight last night. And I'm all right with it. I'm good. Um, so I think, you know, if I hated my job and I'm shutting my laptop down at midnight, that is a horrible, long existence and you don't want to do that. So I go back to you, know, you got these four years. So by your sophomore year, you want what are you into? You just got to kind of think, okay, what am I into, and, and how can I get a job in that industry? And then you really need to target, okay, that, that how do I get a job? You need to just start doing some research. For me, it was I knew I needed to get an internship, and I think that's probably true across the board. That internship is it. It is money because it that's what it's going to be. You're going to get course credit for it in the short term. But that, if I don't get that internship at Cotter, I'm, I don't know, I don't know how I can start. And I, but I do know this: if I don't have that internship summer before my junior year and I graduate, and then I'm trying to figure out how to get a job, I am spinning my wheels, and I'm just one dude in a sea of people trying to get into sports marketing or into racing because there's a lot of people who want to get into it, but. 
unfortunately, not a lot of them are very good. Not a lot of them are very experienced. So if you can rise above that by getting a plan together your sophomore year so you can get your internship together your junior year or that summer before your senior year, and then take those contacts and stay in touch with them, but then during your senior year, apply a lot of what you learned during that junior year, that summer of your junior year, to where when you graduate, you actually get something tangible. Here's the art, here are the articles I wrote in the newspaper. Here are the press releases I wrote for my fraternity. We got these um, media hits out of it. Because it's, it is hard when you graduate, it's like, what do I got? You, you've got your degree and that's excellent, you've got to have it. That's, that's a no-brainer. But then, what's, what real world experience do I have? That's, it is hard to get that beyond like waiting tables or moving furniture. I mean, that was, that's what I had. And if you're trying to get a job in sports, that, that doesn't really convey much because everybody's got that kind of experience. So how do you figure out a way to stand out? And that's, that's, that's beyond key. So after that internship, uh, the fraternity at, that I was a part of at, at Lenore Rhine, overall was good, just like probably a lot of folks in the Greek system. We, we had mostly good points, but we, we would have some self-inflicted wounds and do dumb things, even before I even showed up at Lenore Rhine. So we had, to, we had some work to do in terms of, I guess, brand rebuilding is probably the best way to describe it. So I took a lot of what I learned at, at Cotter, and we have we had great philanthropic endeavors. We actually had guys, Pi Kappa Phi, the, the, the chapter that I was in, we were kind of the every person fraternity. We had jocks, we had stoners, we had nerds, we had New Englanders, we had SoCal guys. It didn't matter. We had everybody. And that, that's honestly, if that chapter didn't exist, I probably wouldn't have been agreed. But the the point of it is, is that a lot of people were really, really great in their niches, whether it was a baseball player or someone who was fantastic in, in the arts or what have you. So we started highlighting those people. Then we really highlighted what we're doing with philanthropy to where I actually had in the bathroom I saw it, you know, you could go in and really stuff the ballot. So I'd write a press release about how we would have this run to Charlotte. Our national headquarters were in Charlotte, North Carolina. Our chapter's in Hickory. Thank God we had a bunch of guys in the cross country team, but at the chapter we would run from Hickory to Charlotte. We get local businesses to you know to to you know sponsor a, a mile or a lap or what have you, and we raise good money for that. And so this is good. We need to let people know this. Write a press release, so we'd send it out, send it to local affiliates in Charlotte, send it to like Hickory Daily Record, uh, the Charlotte Observer, the uh, the Catawba Valley Neighbors, a lot of local papers that still existed then. Uh, WHKY, the, the cable affiliate, but then we'd stuff them out. I'd print off 100 of those and I'd go to the faculty boxes and I'd put a press release in every single faculty box. And I know some hated it because they probably hated fraternities and they were never going to get over it. But I also think it, it enlightened a bunch of people like, wow, they actually, they, no one had ever done any kind of outreach. So like, oh, we know this. And they're not all idiots. They actually go some good stuff. And so, long story short, we went fraternity year. So again, it goes back, I, I have these experiences and I'm able to take some tangible, I'm able to create something tangible with these press releases and I'm able to show what they generated. Not only a media exposure, but how we were able to successfully do a, a sort of brand rebuilding of our, of our chapter of Lenore. So, you know, if there are opportunities like that, um, take advantage of them. And, and, and I looked at this school. And I paid attention, attention to it since. So I know that those opportunities exist. And the beauty of a small school like this is likely there's a need. So unlike a big school where you know you got 10 people who want to be editor of the newspaper, I know when Lenore Ryan's like, anybody want to be editor? Anybody? Could we really do that? So I gotta believe that's probably in certain genres, it's probably the case here. Don't, you know. Apathy drives me nuts, but if there are a handful of you who want to seize opportunity, apathy can be your best friend because nobody else is doing it, you can seize it. You can take hold of it and, and you can own it because nobody else wants to do it. And the, while that's a lot of work, the flip side of that is when you do do it, because if the bar was here and you bring it up to here, everybody knows it. 
phenomenal opportunity, and you're not going to have it when you graduate. Because after that, it's, it's, it's cutthroat, and the pool gets really, really deep, really, really fast. Uh, this, is, this is a fantastic time to hone everything that you got, hone your writing. And since this is about writing, you know, I, I, cannot, I cannot enforce and stress how important writing is. I, I don't care what happens in technology. I don't care if Snapchat becomes the form of communication 10 years from now. You have got to know how to write. And honestly, the short attention span theater of media and social media now that keeps going like this, I'll argue that it makes writing even more important. It's a whole lot easier to, to, to put a thought on two or three pages. How do you condense that thought into this? And that's what social media is doing. And so whether it's a Facebook post, a, a, a tweet, uh, a, a caption on Instagram, or, or what have you, it's massively important to figure out a way to convey a thought creatively and concisely so that you don't lose the attention span of everyone, but at the same time to where it stands out. Because guess what? Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. There isn't a team around that isn't on social media and on multiple platforms. Hell, at Stewart House Racing, we have seven social media platforms that we manage. We've gotten smart this year to realize. All right, we have 300 followers on Pinterest. We're not spending any more time on Pinterest. <laughs> so we're, we're focusing on Facebook. We're focusing on uh, Twitter. We're focusing on, on Instagram. Instagram probably the, the, the biggest growth property. We've looked at a lot of other things like Snapchat. And it, to do it right, it takes a massive investment. And race teams aren't going to spend money on Snapchat because it doesn't make the race car any faster. So NASCAR, however, is very heavily involved in Snapchat. It's embraced it, so we're going to ride their coattails. And uh, whatever they want, we're going to try to launch. So I think uh, Kevin Harvick at Phoenix, uh, race morning, we had uh, one of their social media folks from NASCAR join us for like tagging along with Kevin via Snapchat from the moment he leaves the infield to going to the Budweiser suite to this appearance to this, and you just chronicled all that. So I think that's how we do that. So there's got to be some questions. Uh, yes? So I would ask, how has your writing style evolved since college? Um, it certainly has gotten better. Um, and it gets better every time I write. You know, a lot of people in my position, I guess I'm unique, I am still, um, it's good and bad. It's kind of a ball and chain, but it keeps me sharp. I am still writing the advances for the number 14 team in Tony Stewart. So that's one of the reasons why the laptop went down and made that last night. Um, I like it because it keeps me sharp. Um, it keeps me engaged. Um, it makes me smart because I know because I wrote it. I, I wrote, we do two things with an advance. We, it's like a two page, sort of like a preamble, kind of tease up the quotes, and it's just quotes from Tony. And then we have what we call a team report. And the team report is really geared toward your live TV and radio recovery. It's stats, it's pull it so they can highlight it, pull it. So honestly, if you have a chance, if you have Fox Sports 1, watch practice tomorrow. Mark was just doing right. Larry McReynolds, he's like the Vin Scully of, of, of racing. He, if you put it in front of him, he will read it. So when that camera is on any car, and he's pulling out some cool anecdote, someone like me gave it to him. So anyhow. So I do it because then when I see Larry McReynolds or I see a producer or, or whomever, it's all up here. I can recite, you know, that Tony Stewart won this race in October 2011 and it was the catalyst that allowed him to win his third Sprint Cup championship. And at the halfway mark, he was in jeopardy of going a lap down. Like I can just do it like that because I wrote it. And um, the other thing is, is that, you know, it's tough to find good writers. Like I'm, when I hire someone now, I feel like I'm a college. I feel like I'm a football coach. I'm like, go. I, my short list is stupidly short to where if I don't get that girl, or that guy, I'm, like, I'm screwed. I'm not going to get on this program because they. I can teach people a lot of different things. I cannot teach you how to write because for two reasons. You should already know how. And I'm not, I got enough, I don't have a whole lot, I'm, I'm, I'll take the time to teach you the nuances of the sport, dealing with a driver, dealing with a sponsor, dealing with a corporate entity, dealing with a sanctuary body, dealing with a track. I am not going to teach you how to write. You went, you went to school for 12 years before you went to college, I'm not going to teach you how to write. I expect it to be good, I expect it to be, to 
you know AP style, I, I, that's, that is my expectation. And if it's not there, I'm moving on to where one of the ways that I really call through all the resumes when I, when I, when I interview folks, I say, this is all great. All right, here's what I want you to do. Um, and two, by the end of, I get, usually get folks 48 hours. By the end of Wednesday, I want you to write a press release that you have just been named as a driver for a fifth entity at Stuart Haas Racing. Go. I want, I, I want to see, I want to see what your AP style is. I want to see how well you can write a lead. I want to see how that bridge goes. I want to see the body. I want to see the details that you put into it. And that is an awesome litmus test. Because if that's good, I don't have to teach you how to write. And I'm not going to. So that's one thing I don't have to do. And I can teach you everything else. And so that tells me that I think writing is such a good indicator because it's, it's, it's got to be detail oriented. It's got to be creative. It's got to be engaging. And if, and if you tick those three boxes, and you can hit a lot of other things. And I'm not talking just motorsports. Think of all the minor league baseball teams in the Carolinas. Let's say you hate motorsports and can't stand it. Right? Working at a minor league baseball team is phenomenal. You will work your ass off. But you'll do everything. You'll sell tickets. You might even be the mascot one night. You'll have to deal with, you'll have to deal with a high-priced high -priced baseball player who they just signed who probably thinks he's too good to be down in Hickory, North Carolina or something. So you're going to learn about what it means to like deal with athletes. Sometimes they're cool, sometimes they're not. You'll be able to roll with it. You have that on your resume, you can go places for two reasons. One, everybody knows what, what goes into minor league baseball and how everybody has to seemingly do everything. So one, it stands out. I know it stands out for me if someone were to say, yeah, I miss, did this with the, you know, the Greensboro Bats or the Canapolis Intimidators. Because I know what goes into that. But the other plus is that you're already you know, it's, it's called a farm system for a reason. It's not just for players. You do well in the farm system, and the White Sox organization in Chicago knows, or or the Grapefruit League entity that they work with knows. And next thing you know, you, you're you're part of a uh, you're part of the system and, and can move up. So it's not just racing. It's not just stick and ball stuff. That's that's fairly true across the board. I think the other thing to know about in sports is, you know. When do you want to be entertained? You know, you, you work, let's say you get up at 6, you work by 8.30, home by 6, you do eat dinner, you turn it on. Or on the weekends, you're going to go see a race, go see a football game. Well, when you work in sports, you got to work the regular hours to where you get up at 6, you take the kids to school, you show up at work at 8, 8.30, and then you're getting ready for the event that's entertaining you. And so then you're seeing that event through. So when the game's over, you probably have another two hours worth of work to do. And then you're doing it all over again. And on top of this, you're doing it at nights. You're doing it on the weekend. So that's another thing. It's like, all right, I want to work in sports. All right. Who wants to work seven days a week? <laughs> Who wants to get on it in racing? Who wants to get on an airplane on a Thursday and come home on a Monday? You want to do it? Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and Labor Day. All right. I mean, if if you want to do that, there there's a place, and if you're good at it, you can make a niche for it, and you can really make a name for yourself because the the level of commitment it takes to do the job, the level of commitment it takes to do it right, especially on the writing side, is high. But if you show that level of commitment, you can go. I mean, I graduated Lenore Ryan in 1997. By uh, 2000, I'm representing. Tony Stewart and, and Home Depot. Home Depot. I mean, Home Depot trusted their brand to someone who, you know, was only two years removed from like legal drinking age. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if 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 when you grab when you can get a hold of those opportunities and make the most of them, you you can you could truly make the most of them. People will notice. So, anything else? Yes. I had a question about, yeah. uh, so you said during your internship that you would write a press release and yep. two colleagues would look at it and then the manager. Mm -hmm. and now that you're writing your own advances and you continue mm -hmm. to do that, do you have a similar process that you follow? Do you have like a, a Yes. Well, um, it's not exactly a yellow sheet process, but before we send anything out, uh, it, will, it has the original author and then it will see two other sets of eyes. 
So it goes Laz Dennis, who handles our, uh, we represent Wayne Taylor Racing in the two door United Sports Car Series Championship. He also splits the schedule with another guy for the U.S. Army account who represents the NHRA. Laz is probably one of our better writers. So uh, now everybody we have is already a good writer. So think of it as Laz takes the 220 grit sandpaper to it. And then Kelly, my wife, gets it, who's a pretty good copy editor to ensure that sometimes when you're making edits, you can lose what the original author had. Or if you're making too many edits, you can honestly make a typo within the edit. So then Kelly comes in, and that's when she's making sure that, OK, this sounds right, this works, it's got the grammar right. And then it goes back to the original writer, and then you can hit send. So, and then, you know, in, in, in a corporate world, I guess, like, for instance, if I'm writing a, a, a release about a new sponsor announcement, that's a whole other matter, because I'll write it, I'll share it internally at, at Stewart House Racing. We're on board with how we want it to be perceived, then we send it to the company. And sometimes it's like one director of communication at the company, sometimes it's that person, and then their colleague in marketing, and then the public relations company, so it can get a little involved. But again, it just goes to show, you know, it better be right. Because if, if we're sending a release out, hey, you just spent millions with Stuart House Racing, and we just spelled the name of your CEO wrong, we look like dumbasses. <laughs> And what, why are we spending millions with a company who can't even spell our name right, or, or this is spelled wrong, or that's, I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I can't stress the importance of good writing in those situations, because so often it is, the, it is the first impression. And if that first impression is screwed up, man, that's a big hurdle to overcome. And they'll hold it over your head, and it just, and it's, it takes a lot to overcome, so don't, don't put a hurdle in front good writer and be diligent and look at it. One of the things that I do, I'll look at it on screen and it will be, it'll be right. I, I've, I've edited, I've, I've, I've proofread it. The last time I read it, I didn't make an edit to it. Hit print. I'll go walk the dog. I'll go do something else. And I swear to God, it doesn't matter what it is. Reading it, reading it on hard copy after I print it, I will inevitably find something. I look at that. So it's just, you know, it, that attention to detail goes a long, long way because I tell my folks I will, I will take quality over quickness. I would have much preferred to have my advanced material out for this upcoming race at Martinsville. I would have loved to have had it out on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Tuesday was, was filled with conference calls. Wednesday wasn't any better, so guess what? That stuff went out at like 9 o'clock last night. Not ideal, but not a deal, kill, deal breaker either. But you know what? It was right. It was accurate. And whether it's Jennifer Fryer with the Associated Press or Chris Myers or Leonard Larry Reynolds in the booth reading it, they know that it's right. And so they can just, oh, that's a great step. I'm going to read it. Because here's the other flip side. If you screw it up and they read it, you just made Daryl Walter look stupid on national television. And he's going to remember that. So he's not going to read your stuff the next time. I mean, he's not going to look at it. And you're not going to get that story that you would have had. So it's, you know, it's, the stakes are high. And that's why it's important to be diligent, to put the time in now, to, to really make it good, make it concise, make it creative, but by all means, make it right.